Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Finding the right voice for Darth Vader was another challenge. And action! Lucas had never intended to use the on-set vocal hey. performance of David Prowse. Start tearing this ship apart piece by piece until you find those tapes. Find the passengers in this vessel. I want them alive! <laughs> go, go, go! <laughs> Frame rates. I'm Brian Brushwood, and I was waiting patiently for Tom to say the part where he says frame rate. It's the show about cutting the cord, but Tom's not here. He's left the country, which means I had to go out and find two of my BFFs. So we are joined by Ayaz Akhtar of Tech News Today. How are you doing, Ayaz? I am terrific. I was also waiting for Tom to say something, but he's not here. Oh, you know what? It would be pretty freaky if all of a sudden Ghost Tom just showed up and floated. Like, he's my Obi-Wan Kenobi, like in that clip, only it's low budget. There he is. Uh, <laughs> There he is right He looks there. so happy. And wait a minute. There you are behind him. How are you doing this? That's, that's me disapproving of my own intro to this episode. <laughs> of the Frog Pants Network by Scott Johnson, who just got back from the incredible Nerdtacular 13. How's it going, Scott? I am great, and so did you. And a uh, huge thanks for you to, uh, for you coming. And if people out there want to see how things went and you want to see how... Uh, how Schwood did at this year's event. We'll have tons of photos and video up soon. I am barely awake right now, I have to be honest with you, but I am stoked to be on the show, so thanks for having me. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, let's go ahead and dive right in with the big story. This just in, the big story. So this first story I actually heard from, again, Tom, the guy, the real brain behind everything. I'm like a pale shadow. I'm like a barking dog compared to Tom. <laughs> you can see it in that photo. But while he was on the panel, you guys just started talking. I was in the audience watching, and then Tom starts dropping that, uh, man, we're in the last few minutes of uh, Hulu getting bought out. And we've got a number of different uh, people who are still in as of the time we're recording this. Uh, Silver Lake and WME have bowed out at this point. So the big players are essentially DirecTV and uh, AT&T uh, with a little, or actually, I guess, the churning group uh, with a little bit of extra muscle from AT&T. Have you guys been following this? Yeah, we just well, covered this on uh, TNT. I was going to say, I'll bet you guys covered it um, today. We heard about it first, like said on stage, Tom brought it up during our uh, games and media panel, and I was a little bit shocked as well. I was sitting down on the front row asking questions, and I couldn't quite believe what I was hearing. Um, here's the bit, though, that makes me nervous. Um, I don't, I, well, I shouldn't say it makes me nervous, but if you said to me, hey, DirecTV looks like they're, they're the guys that are going to end up with this thing, I like that less than what I think the next answer is. But then you tell me it's AT&T, and then I get, <laughs> I get more nervous. And it's not that these companies aren't bad at the thing they do. I just don't think they're good at the thing they want, um, if that's a way of putting that. So I, I don't, you know, again, it's a, these are huge companies with tons of money, lots of coffers. They may approach it like Yahoo did Tumblr and say, we're not going to mess with what's good about Hulu. We're only going to give it better backing and more money and the ability to grow and to get more contracts with more content producers or whatever. And that may be just the whole play here and extend their brands out, out, you know, onto Hulu. But these companies aren't known for treating these kind of properties well, even their own kinds of sort of Hulu-like solutions and services. So I don't like either of these these choices. Well, there is a I wish third, somebody else was doing it. There's a third option. We covered this on, on Tech News Today. Today It was the Hollywood Reporter who said that the Guggenheim Group is the third group, and they are a private equity uh, buyer headed by Ross Levinson. He used to run Yahoo for about like a, an, an eye blink. For a little bit. So this is the only like entrepreneurial kind of, uh, of company going after it. But DirecTV and, a and AT&T back in the Turner Group, those seem interesting to me because those guys would have the contacts in the business to keep the content deals on Hulu. Because I'm afraid if a private equity company gets Hulu, the potential is Disney and, and Fox and everybody else are like, yeah, we're not going to put our content there. We'll just do it on our own websites. And who knows what Hulu becomes at the end after that. 
Yeah, well, one not, of the... Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Scott. No, I was just going to say, not everybody loves where Hulu is today, or, or do they? I mean, that was something that actually came up in that panel as well. Tom made that point, that he doesn't love how Hulu is run now. It's kind of a, it's a weird uh, thing to say, here is a, a service, and we're going to give you an upsell on that service and pay us eight bucks a month, and that will give you more programming, but really it isn't that much more programming, and you don't get that much advantage over standard TV, and you're still getting fed commercials. So there's a lot of talk about how Hulu is still just Hulu, and that's kind of a problem anyway. You know, what would these companies do to sort of improve what that service already is? Why do well, people always complain about the ads on Hulu? Oh, go ahead, Ayaz. How could, why do people always complain about the ads when you pay for Hulu, considering when you pay for cable, you have ads? I just, I've always been confused by this concept because you get ads – when you when you get this giant cable bundle, why do people go? Oh well, you know, another ads and I'm paying eight bucks. That's ho that's horrible. Like, well, well, the ads you get though are lots of varied ads. I get a Honda ad, then I get a Coke ad, then I get an ad for some local thing because they have a certain time where they get to run local ads and stuff. When I watch Hulu, I get the same ad every break, every time. So it's not that the I don't think that's a problem so much. There is a variety issue, and it gets to the point that if they're doing Allstate, they've got some deal with Allstate, and all I get is Allstate ads every 20 minutes all day long on Hulu, that is obnoxious and not, I think that's what takes it out of the same realm as what cable TV is already established as normal. And, and we've also talked before about how, uh, you know, the, it's very mushy and ambiguous what you get for your Hulu Plus subscription. Uh, you know, practically what you get is the ability to watch stuff on your iPad and, uh, and in, in your living room television set. But uh, And maybe there's a dollar value to that, but but the uh, the bizarre nature of what, you, what becomes available with Hulu Plus is one of the problems. Uh, some of the things that I think are clear is that they need to sell... Hulu. Hulu needs to be its own independent force to uh, negotiate its own deals uh, to protect its own interest. And this weird, mushy middle that they're in right now where you got some partners that want to charge more and make it ad free, other partners that want to, you know, make it free and then have more ads. Uh, that needs to end, and I think you do have to have a clarity of vision here. The weird thing about this handoff is that the moment they let go and sell it, Hulu's going to turn around and negotiate deals with the people who owned it, and uh, and it's going to be highly adversarial. And, of course, the new people who own it uh, need to make these deals work, otherwise... Otherwise, Hulu loses its value. The value of Hulu right now is in its partnership. It's in the content that it has licenses to uh, to show. Anything else you guys want to say about this before we move on? Well, if you, I think you nailed it. They don't have, what does Hulu have? What does Netflix have? What does any digital streaming service have, if not good content? And I feel like this whole rush to get Hulu in the hands of somebody who can take it further has more to do with the fact that Netflix has gotten stronger by having exclusive content so for all the house of cards and for all of the you know season sixes of arrested development that you get the more sweaty these other companies that are trying to provide similar services get and they kind of try to make a land grab of their own so right now what's weird about hulu is yes they've got some original content but none of it is on anyone's really you know nobody looks at that list and says oh man i can't live without that weird office like comedy that they look like they film with a bad camera Nobody's doing that. Until they get the kind of content that makes people go, oh, I have to have Hulu, then right. they're not going to be able to compete in that space. So they're going to be less important to the content providers. They're going to be less uh, aggressive in trying to make these deals. So to me, this comes down to get somebody with enough money and enough clout and enough push and enough existing deals that they can push more into that space and become an alternative or at the very least a really complimentary service to, to things like Netflix. Then Hulu matters again. Yeah. Yeah. Hulu's got to right. figure out its message. That's part of the problem. They're trying to please too many masters at the same time. They had some pretty cool things like Hulu Desktop, things that let you use it as a power user. And they don't do a very good message explaining what you get with Plus. One of the big things that drew me in was getting 720p quality video out of Hulu, not just the tablets and the apps and that kind of thing, but getting higher quality video to me was actually worth the money because that's what I would pay for a cable or an antenna or something like that to do right. that. So whoever ends up with Hulu, I hope they... They pick a direction and go with it because if DirecTV gets it, I'm figuring it's that TV everywhere style. It's going to be this, you have to be a subscriber to DirecTV to access it. Just go in one direction, whatever they do. Right. All right, let's move on to another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. Uh, Apple TV, both the uh, oops, and then I deleted the big story. There we go. Uh, Apple TV <laughs> has reportedly hired some uh, talent from Hulu. 
uh, specifically, let me get his name, Pete Distad, to negotiate future media deals. Now, that is one thing that Hulu's been very good at is uh, securing the bulk of the content. If you want relatively fresh shows, you know that Hulu is the one that's branded there. The big problem, uh, as, as I'm sure Ayas can chime in on, uh, that's rumored to have delayed at the Apple TV uh, set or physical television has been Apple's uh, desire to get these deals all worked out. And so you got somebody who's very connected here. How do you think that's going to shape things in the short term and the long term for Apple TV, both the set top box and the proposed actual television? Well, it makes sense. Steve Jobs was always reported to be so upfront and personal with these deals in the past when it came to music deals and then even, you know, later video content deals for iTunes and, and the current app t Apple TV. He was the guy that would seal the deals He'd go in there and scare everybody and shake their hands and make it happen. Uh, it makes sense to bring somebody in. If you're going to have somebody focus on this, it makes sense to have somebody in there who's done a lot of deal making when it comes to content. And you have to admit, if you're talking about existing content or current content that's showing up on TV or was a great series in the past or whatever, this is one area where Hulu has really had a lot of strength. And even though some of those deals meant, well, you got to wait a week to get that new episode of one series or a day for that other series, or we're only going to leave six up there at a time. And so you better keep current and that sort of thing. Even though that's all true, it seems to me that that Apple needs a guy who can come in and at, at the very least start this ball rolling if it hasn't already been started. Because this is the like you keep saying, it's all about content. If they don't get these deals, I don't care how good an Apple TV looks or how technically awesome the hardware is. Nobody will care if they can't lock that down. Let's Do you think this? Oh, go ahead, Eyes. It's a great hire for Apple because who ha who would have experience dealing with a terrible relationship with networks? Hulu. Anybody at Hulu, even if they were owned by the networks, they had like the worst relationship with them because they were like, we want to do something cool. And I was like, no, you can't. So this guy should have an insight and the, the uh, networking ability to get these content companies on. It's a, it's a real bear out there because Intel's trying to do something similar. They want to do a cable, uh, they want to do television programming over the internet, but they're willing to pay a lot more money according to certain reports. And that's the kind of thing that Apple doesn't want to do. They don't want to be oh, yeah, we're going to pay you more than the traditional cable companies because that's not what's, what's in it for them. It's going to be a long time before we actually see some cable-quality television over the Internet without a subscription. Well, these, so are, these are the guys, and this is the guy that's had the fights, right? So if he goes into these executives, goes into these teams who are making these deals and says, all right, I fought you guys tooth and nail last time, and you only gave me eight episodes of The Simpsons once. Thanks for that. But now I'm with Apple. And we are the biggest company in the world with the largest market cap, and we got money coming out of our butts. Why don't you come over here and do it here now? It, that actually kind of makes sense to me. Like, he's just walking into some of the same fights with a bigger freaking hammer, and maybe he'll go home with a bigger prize. So, be great. Uh, weirdly, Ayaz, it sounds like your point was that even though hiring this guy puts them in a much better position and, and makes them more qualified than ever to negotiate these deals, the mere fact that he's coming in now is an indicator that we're a long way off from any kind of sensible deal uh, where it struck. It's, it's about money for these companies, right? Simple as that. And if Apple isn't willing to pay them a lot of money, that's not going to happen because these cable companies have been doing this for such a long time. This is so lucrative for these content companies that they don't want to go, oh, yeah, we'll go out for cheaper or we'll, we'll go uh, a la carte. We'll have actual numbers. That seems to scare the heck out of people when it comes to uh, the content business because when you have this Internet-based thing, you have the metrics to determine what's popular and what's not. And for some reason, when you do know those numbers, it freaks out these companies. Right. Now, keep in mind, you had mentioned that you think it's going to be a long time until you get any kind of content without a cable subscription on uh, the Apple TV. And that's exactly what it looks like with Time Warner Cable is striking a deal to stream its content for App, uh, Time Warner Cable subscribers to the Apple TV. This will be the first time the Apple TV has ever streamed any live content with whatever uh, channels it has. Um, I don't know if this is official or rumored at this point. Yeah, it's a rumor at this point. Uh, but it makes sense because... Time Warner, of course, has already announced a deal to bring its content to Xbox. I believe it was announced. So hard for me to keep mm -hmm. track. That's a real announcement. I think that's right. Time, yeah, that was the yeah. Time Warner deal. But here's the the weird bit about that is, um, and the reason I'm a little bit surprised about it, is it's 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 a little bit like robbing Peter to pay Peter. Because um, <laughs> really, what are we doing? Well, if, if from an unplugger's perspective, from my perspective, the whole idea was to move away from a cable subscription that I'd have to pay every month and get more... I know the word a la carte is being overused a lot, but I don't know another one to use, so I'll say it. But I'd like to be able to pick and choose. I want to buy this season on iTunes. I want to watch that on Hulu. My Roku box is going to play that Netflix th thing for me, and I've got these choices now. All this does is say, 
My Apple TV is my new cable box. I'm going to be paying a cable subscription, and it's still going to be playing the I'll same stuff what, I didn't want to watch. So. I'll tell you what, though. Like, the DVR interface is so lousy on Time Warner that it's like that alone would be worth, like, a, like if I still had Time Warner cable, uh, I would go out and spend the 70, 80 bucks to get an Apple TV just so I could live in one ecosystem where I didn't have to go out and use their terrible, terrible interface and remember what channel numbers things are for all that. Uh, and also, this helps to position them. This is what cable companies need to start doing if they plan to stay alive is remain relevant to the game. They need to stop looking like the gatekeepers preventing people from getting the content they wants and instead just look like the the bully bouncer who gets it in. He's like, well, you got to, you got to, once you're, it's like a protection racket. It's like, look, man, you're a subscriber. I can take care of you. I can get you in to watch HBO or, or whatever, you know, all these uh, discovery channels or whatever it is they put on there on Apple TV or on Xbox or whatever. Like if they can pull that off, then people might not give up their subscriptions if they if, if they provide a way, even if it's a lousy one that's expensive. Um, you know, I, I could see it working for them. I don't like it, but I could see that being a smart well, play. Well, that's a really interesting thing because think about it this way. I hadn't really thought about this. This is really good for Time Warner. If they can pull this off, it's really good for them because they're not in my market, for example. It's all Comcast where I live. And that's pretty much your big cable choice. There's a couple of local weird things where they license stuff, but it's mainly Comcast. Imagine a world where I'm getting the entire Time Warner package over my Comcast high-speed internet wow. on, an Apple, on an Apple TV. I mean, essentially, they have leapfrogged the hardware barrier. You don't have to have all this cable in your yard or up to your road and then final mile to your house or whatever. That's no longer where it's connected. They don't care how we're connected because it's all streamed over the internet. They are now being able to because in the past that's the only way you got around this stuff is you put cable in and you used existing stuff or rented or leased lines and now you don't have to do that and that's kind of crazy if, if they can pull this off if the price is right and consumers embrace it it's a pretty interesting kind of leapfrog over a lot of problems cable has faced in the past yeah, but there's nothing saying that this time warner deal is going to be any different than what they have with roku or xbox that's a limited selection you have to have you have to have a subscription. And the, when I saw Time Warner was talking to Apple, or at least the, the stories of that, it's that's not exciting to me because Time Warner's on everything anyway. They've shown the ability to be on every device because they probably, at some point, they don't want to be in the hardware business. They don't do that very well. They probably don't want to negotiate with Motorola or, or Scientific Atlanta, you know, massive <laughs> companies, to make these terrible DVRs. If they can just say, hey, look, you can use an Apple TV. It's still a limited selection if it, if it does happen. I think it was 300 channels for the Xbox. When we are able to use any device as a cable box, that would be nice. But it's, it's still like this kludge. You, you run the Time Warner app and there's no unified search. You can't find the things you want to find. It's not recording things all the time. It's just kind of, it's like, all right, I have another way to have a different cable box. I'm just so not excited about this. Interesting. What's yeah. it's, it's interesting because what you're describing sounds like a big step up from the current experience, and uh, but, but it still doesn't <laughs> do it for you. All right, let's move on to uh, yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. A lot of people in the chat room, when I ask people what the big story is, uh, all of Twitter cried out that uh, uh, the big story should be uh, Giant Bombs. Ryan Davis, uh, very big surprise, passed away at the age of uh, 34, married only a week. Uh, terrible, terrible news. Uh, Giant Bomb, of course, a, a fantastic network and and peers of ours. And if you're into to, to game coverage, it's uh, it's really a tragedy for everyone. we got to pass this on. Uh, I don't know that there's much to say. Did you guys cover this on TNT? Uh, no, uh, I just found out by the news during the show on Twitter, and I was just shocked. Yeah, yeah, it is shocking. I've had a little bit of interaction with Ryan, and um, it, it really caught me off guard. I knew about his wedding. I wished him well over Twitter. He's uh, always been very accessible that way. We tried to get him a few, uh, I guess a couple of years ago, we tried to get him on uh, a couple of shows on Twitter. We were trying to get him on forecast with Tom and I, and had a terrible time with schedules, partly because those guys are so busy, but... They are kind of pioneers in this brave new world of personality industry coverage, in their case, video games. And what they've done for podcasting, specifically Ryan's, really spearheaded that over there uh, yeah. in terms of game coverage, is really renowned. And I'm, I, it's a huge loss for video games. It's a huge loss for podcasting. And it's a huge loss for anyone who knew him. And our, uh, our thoughts, obviously, are with his, with his family and his friends. Yeah, our, our, our condolences for sure. Uh, let's move on to probably not such a big story. We got a fourth story.
That was some, uh, unfortunately, jaunty music after the nature of that last yeah. story. Uh, <laughs> YouTube is introducing the YouTube Pro Video Series with the goal being you, you got a channel, you're sort of a hobbyist, and they say, let's give you the tools to tell you how to go pro. And I think this is a really interesting investment effort. Uh, I don't know if you guys have watched any of these. But their, uh, their first one was about uh, how to find advertisers, how to get them uh, to actually start you paying for your content on there. Uh, I, this is a very Google way to approach this whole thing where, like, they are trying to build an entire industry from scratch. And I think it's an interesting stab for them to try to seduce people who otherwise might not think about going pro and don't have that background, but to give them the tools. Well, it's an interesting turn, isn't it? It's a way for them to uh, address a problem that they're not talking about in this in this post or um, when they're when they're introducing this thing, which is they've got a lot of high minded ideas about how to take uh, people's content into the future and how to make it monetizable and and how to build out some of the subscription content they want to make. The problem is there's a lot of really mediocre stuff on YouTube. There's tons of it, so it helps them. To help us make better stuff and to have it be better, better quality and understand sound and understand what editors are, are best for and how best to upload your stuff. Even if it just comes down to the kind of compression and, and the, you know, the kind of codex to use to get your video done. These things will help make a better, more proficient user base and therefore better content on YouTube. I think it's a brilliant idea and I'm surprised they haven't done it sooner. It's a great idea. You know, when I first got into video and things, you had to look online. You had these, you know, not so reputable sites. You don't know if it was a, a link farm or whatever. It was impossible to find exactly how to do this stuff. And it serves YouTube really well to have their producers have this information. Or even if you're not making anything yet, this is where people look to to do things. And YouTube, for the most part, has been the de facto video player on everybody's site because it's just it's it's just everywhere. And the, and the so, thing I'm super excited about because the tools you can get from this will get better content everywhere. Somebody's got to teach this somewhere and it's free. So the interesting thing to me is that this seems to be an extension of their complete reversal from their strategy a year or two ago. You know, their strategy was we got Google money now. Let's drop uh, 150 million dollars and get professionals to do professional quality content. Uh, and then you you saw, you know, tie ins and, and trying to legitimize the YouTube brand. And then all of that sort of got dropped. I mean, not entirely. A lot of those channels and partners are still around, but that money tap stopped. And uh, instead, you're seeing focusing on their homegrown hits and instead looking to build that base a little bit more. And it'll be really interesting to see whether that pays off in the long term. I mean, they continue to grow. Their numbers continue to be insane. But I, yeah. I just don't know how many people are already creating content and are waiting for somebody to, to teach them these things. I mean, is this... Well it is a great, it's a question about is it a problem that needs a solution and and I I don't know the answer to that for sure but I had a really revealing conversation with uh, one of the nerdtacular attendees that you and I both know I'm not sure how much he wanted me to say publicly so I'm not going to say his name but he works in Britain for a uh, a company now that makes YouTube videos and they are extremely popular they average 1.8 or 2. Point something million views per video and have over 2 million uh, or no I think they're pushing 8 million subscribers 2. Point something billion views and it's this homegrown, viral, boom, out of the box, exploding thing. And I think, I think that, I think that sometimes YouTube has to kind of go, well, wait a minute, what's really hitting? And what they're finding out is they don't know. It's really yeah. hard to predict. So to curate a bunch of stuff that you think people are going to want, that stuff isn't hitting necessarily. We've seen, like you mentioned, and we won't mention names, but there's been stuff that had came, big names attached, seemed like a big deal, and then petered out in terms of the kind of numbers they needed and they didn't get what they wanted. So instead, I feel like this is their way of saying, let's spread it out. Say big one big video telling you how to do it, and hopefully millions of you try. And of those millions that try, a few thousand of you are going to hit, and a few hundred of you are going to really hit, and that's how they grow this. And I, I hope it is how that works. It's just, to me, it feels a little bit like... Uh, Walk it, you know, like, hey, all these birds should be flying. And you walk over and you just start flapping your arms. And then birds are like, oh, is that how it works? Thanks. And then they fly away. It's like, I don't, I don't think like if they're, if they're, if they're built to fly, they're going to fly. And if they're not, you know, I, I don't know that a series of five minute videos of some people who have already made it uh, running their mouth off about, you know, you need advertisers. Here's how to get one is going to be the difference. But, uh, but it, it is a step in the right direction and it is infrastructure. I guess it, part of it depends on how popular this series is. And uh, how many people, uh, I guess, five years from now attribute their success to having watched them? Yeah. Plus, it's a company that's just so big. You'd think that Google would have enough money and enough really smart people to 
figure it out. In a way, this is heartening for me because what it means yeah. is when something really hits, it's not because some company told us how to do it. It's not because some other way has worked in the past. It's because somebody, some individual or some small group of people figured it out on their own and it happened in this organic, natural way. It is the spirit of what we do. And I, that is applaudable. And I, and I hope, I hope we never quite figure that out because that is a pretty special thing. I know they want to, it's easier to monetize, but you can't force it. You have to let it kind of happen in this environment. And this seems like a way to spread a bunch of seed and just see what soil picks it up and grows. Yeah, but some of us Absolutely. just want to make content, right? That's our dream. You just want to make videos all day. And the, the fact that YouTube's taking on and showing the business side of it, like picking up advertisers and, and editing, that kind of stuff, that's stuff you, that people are reluctant to, well, like me. When I was making mediocre, mediocre content, I wanted to make sure that I was making lots of content. But to figure out all this stuff on my own was a real pain. So just to, just to have videos that you can passively watch and learn, I think that's huge. Well, we'll see how it uh, pans out in the long term. But for now, let's jump into the slipstream. Let's hit it right this time. Cloud-based TV operator Magine, Ma 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 Magine? Well, M -A -G -I -N -E, <laughs> yes. raises $90 million in a Series A round to fuel international expansion. Uh, did you guys talk about this at all, Ayaz? Nope. This is a, a Swedish <laughs> cloud-based cable operator. This is exactly what Scott was just proposing might happen in a situation with like Time Warner Cable. And I don't know what the rules are here in the United States, but in Europe, uh, there's a number of these that are like, there'll be no cable box. There'll be no uh, hardware of any type. You just go to the website and you got your channels available. You're paying your cable bill, but it's all over the top. It's all just on, on the internet. And in fact, uh, over in Europe, this is not regarded as, as punk rock or crazy talk. It's not, you know, here in America, we We've got uh, the entire Aereo debacle happening right now being sussed out in the courts. But meanwhile, the industry likes it over there. People seem to be um, – it's, it's, it's remarkable here in the United States in that it's so unremarkable overseas. Well, one would hope that this – if this stuff is successful over there, it turns heads here. Um, I love this kind of stuff, and I hope that there's more of this. But I assume this is the same issue I has had with the other thing, which is – and I has correct me if I'm wrong, but this is, a, this is another service that you are going to have to either watch on your browser – or if you want to watch it on a couch in front of a TV, you got to have special apps and special devices. Again, that non-unified ecosystems that bother you in this case as well, if you were Swedish. Uh, well, I think Sweden gets everything. They have HBO Go as a separate thing there too. Right? And I think this thing, I'm assuming this name is Magin, by the way. Like Imagine without the I? I just. I, I hope so. I, I like Magin a lot. Magin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Magin, or whatever it's called. I, I, don't, I don't really know how this is going to work. I, I like this idea that apparently paradise is in Sweden. I'm in the wrong space, you know? Yes. Let's all move to Sweden. That'll fix everything right now. Absolutely. And how are we going to get to Sweden? We're going to fly <laughs> Southwest Airlines and use their free TV courtesy of Dish Network uh, for in-flight. Uh, you know, the, there's no, uh, obviously being a, a budget airline, Southwest doesn't have any kind of video screens built into the back of all the, the uh, seats. I fly them a lot and uh, use their internet service, which is on, I believe, 400 of their planes. So more often than not, you run into Wi-Fi service available. And right now they have a few, a very limited selection of TV uh, options, the channels that you can watch live. But now Dish is completely for free to the consumer going to make available, uh, I believe, a limited part of their programming. And they're doing it essentially just for the, uh, just for the buzz, just for the positioning to be known, similar to what uh, DirecTV has done with JetBlue. You guys excited about that at all? Do you guys fly Southwest? Yeah, more than any other airline where I live because um, there's a lot of stuff to Phoenix and, you know, some of the other Western United States, and, and they're big around here. So um, they still have, in fact, uh, the last flight I took was one of those ones where you had to sit across from somebody and kind of have your knees touch the whole time you're flying. That kind of sucks. But other than that, these are cool. I like features like this. I like services like this and the fact that it's free is great because increasingly, as we know, airlines are nickel and diming us for everything. So if you want to have extra bags, you're paying for it. You want to have snacks on the way, a lot of that stuff isn't free anymore. So complimentary services on airlines are nearly extinct. So I open arm welcome the chance to have something for free again on one of those planes. And I like the fact that it's a smart way to use, uh, they don't have to install hardly any infrastructure. You know, this, they don't have to wire anything into seats or to replace anything because everyone has tablets and smartphones and Wi-Fi enabled devices. And the fact that you're getting people to use their own uh, their own devices to connect and get to live content, I think is a very smart move on their part. 
I freaking love this because I've been on enough flights where there's like a resistive touchscreen behind my head and people just thwacking because they've never used one of these things before. They don't understand you can just do a little point. If they have their own devices, they actually know how to use them. So hopefully they'll just be hitting me less and be using their devices. But one of the things that seems like a downside is you can look at the in-flight programming like on Virgin even when your electronics have to be off. So for somebody like me who wants to constantly be connected or distracted, this is kind of like, oh, this is a neat thing for like the hour I get to be in the air. But that, you know, 15 minutes beforehand and after, I'm going to have to read a book. Like yeah. a book. It's gross, right? A paper. Dead gross. trees. Yeah. Print. <laughs> Just, I feel dirty. Uh, next story, we actually have uh, another example. This is, this is back to what you were talking about, about um, the cable companies wanting to be the gatekeepers here. In this case, we've got USA TV is releasing an iOS app that lets people watch shows from their phones and tablets. But again, with that little catch, you have to authenticate with your uh, uh, your cable company, and so I I, I I hate all of this. I don't want to see it. It does. I don't want to have to go back to cable. But I think this is a smart move for cable companies to keep themselves relevant. Well, again, it it brings up that point of like I would trade the ecosystem problem, which is everyone's got a different app. I can kind of deal with because they have to compete for quality and UI and ease of use and making your customers happy. So I'm okay with that part of it. The fact that there there will be a USA Today. Or US Today, USA TV network app right along next to my A and E app, for example. Now those two just have to prove to me, well, this one's better than the other one, and maybe I'll spend more time with the other one than the other. But I, this is the HBO Go problem. I don't want. I am plugged for a reason. I don't want to pay for cable because I don't want that giant package of channels. I don't want. If I just want USA, let me have that. And maybe give me a separate subscription option. I know it's still tied to the everybody down the chain needs the money and the cable operators and the affiliates and everybody else wants to make their money. And that's how the system's built. I get it. But until that changes, this means zip to me. I'm not doing it until they do it. So you, you cut the cable how long ago? You haven't had uh, internet or, I guess, cable of any variety for a long time. I've, I haven't had cable uh, or satellite. The last thing I have was satellite, and I haven't had any of that for about five about five years now. So, wow. Yeah. Long so, yeah, time. No longest, longest unplugger I know of any anybody in our extended circles. And when we first did it, it was really – actually, it was right when uh, Netflix had announced that they were doing the online thing and you could get the beta on a PC – and there yeah. was something about that, that that made me, even though they weren't done, it wasn't on Mac yet, they didn't have apps yet, like none of this other stuff, it, it permeated. But I knew when I heard that announcement, stuff was shifting and I just needed the excuse and we went for it. And so from then on, it's been, you know, there was a lot of iTunes rentals early on, but that kind of slowed as more Netflix and Hulu stuff got better. And, you know, I'm kind of a mix of all those things now, but I've never looked back. Five years of very happy unplugging. So what about you, Iaz? You, uh, I assume, have already cut the cord, right? Well, I did, and then when I moved to my new place, it was cheaper to get the cable option with the internet speed I wanted than just getting the internet speed I wanted. So I do have a right. cable box. It's in my car right now. I just never hook <laughs> it up because I don't really want to have this giant slew of SD channels coming into the house because it's the basic economy thing. Uh, I, I, I'm hoping one day that, like like uh, Scott was saying, this idea that you can like disintermediate your uh, your subscription, just subscribe somewhere. Like This is that kind of concept of pay one fee to somebody. And they get all the content you want, right? This right. is kind of what we wanted with music and other things. And we were like, oh, if we could just pay this license fee a year and let me get everything I want forever, let's just do that. It's kind of the same thing. At some Boom. point, they have to give up on this territorial crap. Why is I hold on? Why is your cable box in your car? What's that doing? Oh, because I wanted to exchange it. I wanted to see if I could get an HD box for the same cost. <laughs> and they're like, no, it's going to cost you ten bucks extra a month. I'm like, oh, well, screw it. I'm not going to. I'm not using this. I'll just keep it. <laughs> I just haven't bothered right. to take it out because I just went to Comcast the store which was fun because the, the lady in front of me had no idea how a router worked, which was fine because I think, I think home networking is far too complex for normal people. Somebody <laughs> should rename the names of these things, by the way. Routers <laughs> and agree. gateways and, and, and modems are not for the weak of heart. <laughs> Global video service Viki, which you've talked about on the program before, has just surpassed the 10 million mobile app downloads mark. Uh, they're based out of Singapore. And uh, what I had poked on their site, I hadn't looked at it before, but uh, they got a lot of content that's all stuff that makes no sense to me, but because it's all very much, uh, it's very international, but you can't get English subtitles on it. Uh, and uh, man, they're just tearing it up. 10 million is uh, certainly no slouch. That's a good install base. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, YouTube confirms that uh, they've renewed their deal with Vivo and takes a stake in the company. They've bought shares, so they own a piece of the action. Vivo is consistently one of the top 
performers on, on YouTube. Essentially, YouTube has become this generation's MTV mainly because of Vivo. Uh, they these their their views are crazy because people go, they watch the videos over and over and over again, uh, and uh, that's that's big news that uh, they're intertwining their fates. So, so all the all the big artists typically show up on this channel, and um, if if you know if I'm not always looking, it's a pretty good bet that my daughter is watching something something on the Vivo channel uh, via YouTube. Yep. So I think that they are pretty tapped into that market, pretty tapped into this sort of under-18 uh, demographic, which is that demographic we talked about on stage the other day that are getting all their entertainment from one place, and that's YouTube. So I think it's probably smart for them, some kind of strategy here to uh, to keep that on tap, to hang on to those guys for dear life and as long as they can. So why not? Why not spend a little bit of that huge amount of cash on something that's already doing well for them? The other thing is this keeps uh, Vivo out of the hands of Facebook because Facebook is rumored around, to, like sniffing around Vivo to get music videos on Facebook, and that would have been huge. But Google pumped in more money and got got the uh, deal again because Vivo does draw a lot of traffic for YouTube. You know, and also the, it should be pointed out that uh, you know Vivo maintains its own website mm -hmm. uh, and and could be in a diff in an alternate reality could be a competitor for uh, for YouTube. But I guess at this point, you know, it formalizes. The uh, the relationship between the two. Uh, it's rumored that uh, YouTube has bought as much as seven percent of Vivo. Uh, let's go ahead and jump forward into tube tops. I know you guys are super super upset. Don't you grab your handkerchiefs because I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab a stress end. pillow. Hang on. All right. <laughs> I'm ready. The end of web TV. No. Microsoft, Microsoft has shut down MSN TV on September 30th. Uh, started in the mid 90s as web TV, one of the first set top boxes to offer internet access via television. Did you guys ever see or touch or use one of those? I used one in a, a hotel that was Me loaded too. with them once, and they had rooms and rooms and rooms full of these things, and it was supposed to be awesome. And I remember the weird bit was um, the remote for the one that we had in this hotel, which otherwise had other remotes for TVs and other stuff like a radio remote, and they were all loose and just kind of around the room. The remote for this, this web TV was tethered to it by a kind of taped on, it was kind of an industrial tape kind of material, something on each end, and it coiled, and it was like to make sure you didn't steal just that remote. The rest of the remotes were fine. They were just loose everywhere, but you couldn't take this Microsoft remote. I always remember that for some reason, but but yeah, I saw it. I remember it. It wasn't very good. We tried to browse the web with it once. I think that they charged us like 12 bucks or something to even pick the thing up and use it. Uh, it was kind of garbage. I never had one in the home. Um, cause again, it seemed pretty janky at the time, but yeah, I'm not surprised this thing. I'm surprised. Actually, I'm surprised this hasn't already happened. The fact that's, that this is that's exactly what I was going to say. It's like the, to me, the story is not that it's dying. The, the, the story is that it was still around. That's amazing to me. Yeah. Maybe Microsoft's feeling that backlash always on internet connection. We can't have any devices like that. Let's get rid of our what? web TV or it was MSN TV. That's what they called it. But I used to use this thing. And the idea was when you had those old CRT TVs, Nothing scaled right, so you needed something like this device to make everything larger and, and, and uh, legible. Then we moved to LCDs, which are effectively computer monitors. You can read things just fine. It, it, the fact that it's around and Microsoft's giving like, a, like three months heads up saying, hey, by the way, the thing you might have, you might not even aware of that's in your garage, it's going to be dead soon. And this usually yeah. happens to Microsoft. Like it's occasionally somebody will shut down a service like Google will say, okay, we're shutting Reader down. But it's a big deal and it's still kind of currently in use and – you know, even Buzz, Google Buzz was, eh, yeah, nobody was really using it, but it was still there and it was a thing. With Microsoft stuff, it always feels like a thing like, what, you're just now shutting down Halo 2 multiplayer servers or, you know, whatever the thing may be. And this just feels like one of those relics again. So I don't know what's next, but I'm, if you think about it, there are so many servers running services out there that we have forgotten all about. There are probably Dreamcast servers for like, NFL 2K or something running still for all we know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that would be awesome to find out, actually, if that's true. But I love hearing about, about when these things find their demise all these years later. I'm sure that's the kind of thing that happens. So uh, I got an email from Team Boxy today uh, or maybe two days ago. Did you guys get this? Uh, I got an email from Team Boxy very curtly saying, we're pleased to announce that the Boxy team will be joining Samsung. Samsung is the number one consumer electronics company in the world. We're working behind the scenes to ensure there's minimal impact to your Boxy box during this pro process. So uh, Team Boxy totally uh, sold to Samsung for about $30 million. Not only that, but their cloud DVR is dead on Wednesday, July 10th. 
So they, Samsung bought Boxy, and they're like, oh, that service you had? Dead. We're not going to expand yeah. this anymore. So Cloud DVR, if you have that, Wednesday. Wow. Sorry. That's it? Oh, yeah. I can't. I it still have a, I didn't ever, I never had a, a Boxy box, but I can't hear the name without thinking of that stupid kid on Battlestar Galactica. So I'll just, I'll just leave my opinion <laughs> right there. <laughs> it's good enough. I really hope Boxy can do something awesome with the UI, like Samsung Smart TVs. Those are kind of a mess. If for their software design, Boxy did something really like impressive with their search. You were able to look through Hulu and Amazon, I think, a whole bunch of different apps at once, and you're able to find things really easily. If Samsung can leverage that into their televisions and other set-top boxes, like maybe Blu-ray players, that would be really kind of cool because they are everywhere. So why not have a good UI instead of that gosh awful smart television interface that we've seen running too slowly? Yeah, Roku ate their lunch no matter what. Like, Roku came in and just said, oh, you guys are making some sweet inroads. Get out of the way. And now they're kind of having to lick their wounds. A tasty lunch. So, uh, right now, there's an anti-piracy and content protection summit happening in Los Angeles. I said right now, I meant last week. And uh, they had a bunch of speakers. And one of the ideas that was bandied about was how are, what is going to be the standards as we move into 4K distribution? You know, we have Sony has their uh, their uh, 4K Ultra HD media player that, uh, that they're going to put out there. Some of the ideas that were bandied about were uh, watermarking every single copy specifically to the person who bought it so whichever version leaks they know um but the 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 one that raised the most eyebrows was the idea of keeping every single player tethered to the internet at all times so that it you have to check in with hq before you play any content on there uh on the one hand that sounds awful and none of us like it we like the idea of owning our stuff and doing it doing with it whatever we want but on another side i mean Internet access is only going to be more reliable and more ubiquitous. You know, we don't make plans for what we're going to do when we don't happen to have running water. We just live our lives assuming that we'll always have running water available. And it's a big, big deal when we don't have it. It, it seems to me like that's the distribution channels. That It seems to me like that's the future. That's the way that people are going to guarantee that they get paid. Well, it's funny because doesn't this seem to go in the face not that they're very unified with their message still but this goes in the face of their ps4 stance which was in large part response to microsoft's goofy announcements and then their retraction but essentially they were saying hey ps4 don't have to connect to nothing man trade them in sell them you own your content so for them to turn around and say all right 4k players and our future in video i think it all should be connected to the internet all the time to help stop piracy it's essentially the microsoft message this just isn't a gaming announcement and That's I think amazing. Kinda, I can't believe yeah. I didn't see that at all. That's a really good observation, Scott. Uh, uh, I and, wonder, and, I wonder and, who will notice course, or not notice. I think it's obvious, but that's just the weirdest turnaround, man. Yeah, it definitely is. Do you, you got anything on this, Ayaz? Well, I mean, this is one of many different versions of DRM they're trying to come up with. Watermarking, I think, is the best way to go if they're going to do any of this stuff. The problem with DRM in general is when, it, when something breaks... I don't think anybody cares that their iTunes stuff works on their Apple TV, even though it's got DRM, because it works fine. When it doesn't, it's maddening. I had a Blu-ray disc that wouldn't play because it needed to be it needed to be in a player that was internet connected, and it needed to contact servers, which were offline. So it's it's about service. If service is really up there and nobody ever notices it's there, that's great. But what happens is when it breaks, and you just want to look at you're looking at this disc, or you you're looking at your streaming player, and you're screaming at it because nothing's working. That's when this stuff breaks down, and that's what drives people crazy. And that's what will eventually go, you know what? I can find a copy of this somewhere else without these restrictions. That's what it sparks piracy more than anything else. That's a very, very good point. Uh, Bill Hicks in the chat room just shouted, damn, they're going to beat pirates again. <laughs> and it's like, this is always the same thing. It's like, no matter which, no matter which of these ideas, no matter how draconian, no matter how much of a hassle they want to make it, and, and, you know, as internet becomes pervasive and always on and always available, I'm less concerned about the idea of a, of a machine needing to check in on the internet. Uh, but th again, the pirates aren't going to be affected at all because they will build devices, they will alter and hack hardware so that they're able to play completely unlocked content. And it's not going to do anything. So I, I don't know what the answer is, but uh, but I think uh, this will not change a damn thing. The first thing I do with my Blu-rays when I get them to avoid all the ads, I rip them. That's the first thing I do. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to even watch it yet. I'm going to put it in my, in my Blu-ray player. I'm going to rip it. I'm going to watch it however I want to watch it because I can't stand being forced. Here's a commercial. Here's the trailer for the movie you're about to see. It's like, I bought the movie. Let me watch what I want to watch. Yeah. Please.
All right, let's Pretty move on best. to Film Film. Film Film, of course, about all of the stuff that you watch on your different devices when you want, however you want. And the first thing I'm going to watch on Thursday is going to be the new release of Orange is the New Black. We've talked about it a whole bunch on the show. Already some uh, TV reviews are coming out on it. Generally, very, very positive. Everybody seems to like it. I'm I'm stoked about it. I really dug Weeds. And, of course, being from the same guy who created Weeds, uh, I am probably as interested in this as I am as I was with House of Cards, especially since House of Cards was so good and Arrested Development was so much fun. Are you guys going to watch it the day it comes well, out? Rem rem remind us, what's the network again? Who's running it? Uh, Netflix releasing all at once the entire season. Uh, they Some of the previews and reviews talk about the first four episodes that they got to see. Uh, the story is about a chick who carried some drugs for a friend at age 22, and now at age 32, it's finally caught up to her, and so she no, it's uh, the prison. The prison one. They're con okay. Got it. And for whatever yeah. reason, this wasn't the name wasn't clicking with me. But I've seen a million like you know panels and stuff on Netflix. Now I got and yes, I'm very much looking forward to this. Now that I remember what it is. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. So uh, are you gonna are you gonna drop in and binge it all on the first day? Uh, probably. Probably not. I find that um, I find the way I do things on Netflix when it comes to like these a series landing like Arrested Development. New season and uh, House of Cards, although I've only seen two House of Cards. I know I know I'm behind. But um, I like the convenience of knowing that it's there and I don't have to consume it really fast. Now, chances are if this thing's super, like, really hardcore entertaining and I can't get enough, there's a good chance that Kim and I will just rip through the whole thing in a sitting and just love it and can't wait for the next thing. But I do like to kind of pace things out. i got a couple other things I'm watching right now. It's nice to mix things up and I like the freedom of not feeling like I need to hurry up and force feed this stuff down. Yeah, the um, trying to goose up uh, some interest for the upcoming release of the Wolverine. You can actually watch over a minute of a fight sequence on a Japanese bullet train. If you head on over to YouTube, uh, this uh, Machinima has it. And I think it's really interesting as Machinima starts to position itself essentially as the Saturday morning cartoons of, of, the, uh, of YouTube, where basically all of Machinima's content is funded by, or I'm, I'm going to say all, but a lot of Machinima's content is funded by studios who are looking to sell video games oftentimes. That's how we got the Halo series from Microsoft and uh, the fact that it's uh, released on there from, uh, I don't know if, if, if Fox probably has it on somewhere else, but that's where I saw it from Machinima. Uh, are you guys going to go see the Wolverine? Are you excited about I'm it? I'm going to see the Wolverine. First one, I was mean, it bad enough that you, you don't care? Well, th this is supposed to be based on the miniseries, which is like the one of the two good stories about Wolverine. Because I used to read his books. I read Wolverine for years, and there's about there's two good stories. There's Weapon X, and there's yeah. the Wolverine miniseries that came out with Frank Miller in 1982. So yeah. this is supposed to be based on the 1982 one, which has me very excited because I was a big comic nerd and a big Wolverine fan. But Machinima having this is intriguing because sometimes when I watch movies, I'm like, that's going to be a great stage in a game. And this fight scene is going to be fun to play once there's the Wolverine game because you got to be able to hang on to the train fight this bad it guy. It really does. It, it looks like a non-interactive video game. And I can't wait to yeah. actually play with this. But yeah, I, I want to watch the movie because I'm just a... That's Wolverine kind fan. of my problem with it is I don't... That scene is looks like CGI picnic. Like, I, it's... <laughs> I, I don't mind... Look, I'm a action scene lover. I love it. Uh, I just watched this incredible Korean movie called The Good, The Bad, The Weird. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it is the one of the coolest things you'll ever lay, lay eyes on. It's on Netflix if you don't have it. I have it on Blu-ray. It's amazing. Um, even with subtitles. Just freaking incredible and i like my action a certain way the way i don't like it is essentially a high priced video game cutscene and that scene just screams that to me i'm a little worried about that yeah. that being said you you're absolutely right that frank miller telling is the best in the in the history of this is, of wolverine as a character there's a lot of good x-men stuff but on his own that stuff is awesome i think it beats weapon x so if they've pulled all the right elements out and they've built that story around the core of that comic we're in for a treat overall but that scene is just like, all right, fake everything, fake everything, fake everything for me. Right. So Screen Rant is reporting that uh, creator of Breaking Bad, Vince Gilligan, is actively moving forward and trying to pitch the idea of a Saul Goodman spinoff from Breaking Bad. He says it could be a prequel series, uh, you know, and, and this is all should be pointed out like this is all talk. You know, this is what Hollywood types do all the time. They sit down and they they toss their arms around and say, I don't know, it could be like this. That'd be really cool. But 
that really stuck with me because uh, Saul Goodman is e easily one of the most interesting characters on the show. But would that be enough for you to tune in? Would you guys like that? No, I want a Mike Ehrmantraut spinoff. And I know that that may, if you've seen the series, and I don't want to spoil anything, it makes it a little weird. I get it. It'd have to be a prequel. I probably just gave it away. But <laughs> wow, you sure is, just spelled that out. <laughs> but I am, I am such a dyed-in-the-wool Mike Ehrmantraut fan. Jonathan Banks is one of my favorite character actors ever. I think that is one of the most insanely cool roles in the history of television. I really, I'm not just hyperbolating all <laughs> over the place here. I really believe that. So if it were me and I was to pick, nothing wrong with the other dude, I like that guy. I just think Mike is your man. I think that's your series. I think Saul's fine in small doses, but yeah, a whole show around him, it could be really irritating. Also, I don't want to diminish Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad's fantastic, and has, it hasn't really slipped up at all. And to have this kind of extended universe to go into, uh, to go into Saul Goodman, that could be fun because you could. I don't know if they're going to make it like a comedy where Saul's got another crazy client and he did something wacky and he's got to call in Mike for help. But it 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 just screams like. A Simpsons well, joke gone wrong. Like, here's a spinoff. You could do this. Now, keep in mind, Vince Gilligan, you know, he's, he's a talented guy and he knows how to tell a good story. Uh, we see Saul Goodman as this um, almost a cartoonish sleazy lawyer who's just, you know, so far off the deep end that he's just a, a, a cartoon of himself. What if, you know, what if we saw him younger, so uh, descending where he faces these moral choices and maybe you see him, you know, starry eyed and optimistic and eventually just becomes the money grubbing uh, sleazeball that he becomes. I, th I think it'd be interesting. Well, combine them. Put Mike, put Mike with Saul, and they, you've got your series. And that's how that you know it's where he came from. He basically we know, started in the series as a cleaner. We know, we know that they worked together in the past from yeah. Breaking Bad. So it's just like you could get your Mike in there. Oh my gosh, his just had these Saul's hitman, his cleaner, his fixer. Ugh, that would be. I'm ready for it. And Gilligan's awesome, despite having the goofiest last name in all of Hollywood. Man, I would. I'd back it's him. Matthew on this. Weiner or Weiner. <laughs> <laughs> right there. <laughs> uh, Reddit co-founder Alexis Ohanian, I think I said that right, joins The Verge to host a new web series. Uh, basically, they're going to do a 10-part series on startup culture. Uh, there's an article on Ho Hollywood Reporter talking all about it. Um, I, I, I don't know that I'm going to check it out, but I think it's great that they're producing original content over at The Verge and that they're getting a, a good talent to be their part of it. I love what The yeah. Verge is doing with their video series. This one's going to be about uh, startups, right, in New York. 10 plus yes. series that seems like that'll be intriguing to see the mindset of people trying to set something up i'm just kind of curious if there'll be any time between shooting this stuff and how popular a product is maybe they'll shoot maybe 30 of them and then like these are oh this one was this one turned out to be i don't know something like vine or whatever but it'd be interesting to see really successful ones and ones that weren't necessarily as good yeah they the cool polygon which is you know sister side to the verge um just as a little, little recommendation here and i forget the name of the series so forgive me i don't have it in front of me but they have this series about gamers and game developers and the particular games that have had impacts on people. That's like this personal documentary style look at what games are and can do and uh, come from and all this sort of thing. It reminds me of some old stuff G4 used to do back when they were better at covering games. And uh, that's an awesome series and you should be Esquire? checked out by everyone. Where? Who? What? No. Esquire, right? That's what Polygons, where I'm seeing it. No, I mean G4. Oh, so G4. Oh, yeah, two... sorry, Esquire channel, right. <laughs> Don't remind me, dude. I had wiped that out of my brain. Do you need a stress memory. pillow too? You can just squeeze the twist. <laughs> All right, I'll send you one. So there are, uh, there are a couple of little things I handpicked here that, uh, that I just want to point out for people to check out. Uh, one of them comes from over at Slash Film. There's a comparison. We'll put it in the show notes, but there's a comparison of music from Superman and Man of Steel. You know, obviously uh, very, very iconic soundtracks, very different from each of them. And to hear somebody who knows their music kind of walk you through what it means between the two was really pretty cool. I don't know if, if we could play like maybe 20 seconds of right. different sections in there. Is really what the original film was trying to I mean, the tagline for the film was, you'll believe a man can fly. And I think this score really gets that across. I mean, um, it really mirrors that mission at getting you to believe that a person can dare go. We'll jump, we'll jump forward here to uh, the song to his where the measure is never really complete. It's always driving towards the next thing. It creates this propulsive uh, feeling. Right when you're listening to this, and it actually kind of sums up the differences between uh, Man of Steel's soundtrack and uh, the Superman the Movie soundtrack. Right? If Superman the Movie soundtrack is about arriving, right? It's about this guy coming to Earth and sharing his amazing powers with us and saving us. But Man of Steel, I feel like, is about yearning and longing and the desire to fit in. 
and the unrequited love for a people, right? And that's what this track is. It's going towards something, and it, it kind of gets anyway. there. But- like he knows his music, and he breaks it down, and he kind of explains. After watching it, I had a much much deeper appreciation for the music of, of both of them, to be honest. I thought it was really thoughtful. That's, uh, uh, I believe, David Chen, was that his name? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Real quick, I just I would say this. Uh, I think the main difference between those two soundtracks is one is very John Williams and one is very Hans Zimmer. And I think it really just boils down to those two guys' style. And, and directors and writers, they pick those guys based on their styles. So perhaps that's what they're trying to convey. But that's just the way Hans Zimmer writes music. And before that, that's John Williams. That's his key stuff. So... It's it's easy to look deeper into that than I think people need to, but uh, you know it's not like this. if the same guy wrote both scores, that'd be one thing. But since these are two two different guys with very different styles, I think it's much ado about nothing. No offense, well, anybody. No, but, but, but keep in mind also, like you, yes, you get different guys who have different styles because you want to tell different stories and you want to enhance different moods. I mean, yes, it's a uh, Hans Zimmer style, but but I think it's I think it's fair play to say you know they went with Hans Zimmer as, as opposed to anyone else they could have gotten nowadays because that was the type of story that they wanted to tell and that was the mood that they wanted to evoke. On uh, Superman Returns, they basically used John Williams' score with I think a new orchestra did it uh, did a version of of his uh, Superman theme. And that didn't have the same feel as the original ones, even though they tried very hard to make the Superman Returns world as the same as the Superman the movie one. The whole thing about Man of Steel is it has that Zack Snyder grayness to it. It's all, everything is muted. It's this, uh, the beginning again when it comes to Superman. So you need that kind of different tone if you want to have people believe something about Superman. Because if they had that super happy music from John Williams, it totally would not match the tone of... uh, of the Hans Zimmer, not Hans Zimmer, the uh, Man of Steel, because it, it just, it's just a very dark, dreary world. And that John Williams is like, here's hope and spirit. And let's right. believe it's, in a Superman. And no, it's, it's, it's a lot like, um, it's what Star Trek did. They, they wanted, Returns tried to do what they did. They wanted to evoke the old stuff without trying mm-hmm. to overuse the old stuff or use that just for nostalgia. They use it in the credits or little bits of it, the little meh, 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 occasionally or whatever. And I think that works pretty well for Star Trek. I think it didn't work in return so well. And I think they, Zimmer and Nolan, who are buddies and probably got the deal together anyway, uh, while working with Zack Snyder, I think they wanted to go for a much deeper, darker tone. And I, they re- all they need to do in the next movie, you guys, all they have to do is just address the devastation. That's all they have to do. And I'm back in. Different yeah, conversation, sure- different podcast, but yeah. Yep. No, I think that uh, that's exactly what they will do. I mean, well, we, yeah, I don't think we're spoiling anything. Uh, all right. We're running short on time. So let's go ahead and jump forward and check out the movie draft. Scott, um, I don't want to break your heart. It's just not looking real good for you in the draft right now. Yeah, I meant to mention this last week. It's sucking for me. <laughs> Lone why Ranger. Do you say that? Uh, oh, that's why. Uh, yeah, Lone Ranger definitely disappointed. Uh, at this point, all of this left. You got Red 2. Uh, what did Lone Ranger do? It did uh, $48 million over the five-day weekend. Did my uh, head in, too, by the way. That in that sucked. same time, Despicable Me 2 went uh, for $143 million. It was a record-breaking opening. Uh, Despicable Me 2 has pretty much sealed the deal at this point. It, it, it put me ahead of Justin. So, uh, and I, so I've got uh, Despicable Me 2, Grown Ups 2, and, and The World's End all in there. Uh, to me, the interesting story at this point is really going to be to see who in chat realm is going to come out on top. Uh, and at this point, it, it looks like, well, this is interesting. It looks like uh, the number one player, there's only one, because you see, we got, we got like, what, four people tied for number two. We got a million people tied for number four. Uh, but it looks like number one, Nokomis FL with uh, Iron Man 3, The Great Gatsby, and Man of Steel, only spending 99 of his $100, is at $820 million, uh, which looks pretty freaking good. Has a chance to sit on top. Who knows? Yeah, I saw Lone Ranger. It's bad. Don't go see it. It's kind of bad. Even to help me. Don't even go to help <laughs> Wow. Me. You're humanitarian right there. You're going to be helping your yeah. own cause. By saying Lone Ranger, which looked awful, uh, apparently is awful. Uh, don't don't watch it, huh? Well, yeah. it's, just, it's Pirates of the Caribbean on horses, and I'm not kidding about that. I'm dead serious. So, here's the question: This week we've got coming out uh, Grown Ups Two and Pacific Rim. Which one of those do you think is going to make more money? Now, Grown Ups Two, of course, is a very approachable comedy that uh, allegedly approachable uh, sequel of Grown Ups <laughs> One, which did well. They've been they've been promoting the hell 
out of Grown Ups 2 for six months now, whereas uh, Pacific Rim has all the geek buzz, but I don't know if the geeks are actually going to come out for it. Well, uh, there's there's a little bit of backlash going on that people don't want to see another movie with giant robots in it because they're so burned on Transformers movies. But I hope they forget, or I, I hope they leave that behind them and realize that you can make something else that isn't Transformers that might have something to do with giant robots that isn't bad. Um, I have really high hopes for that movie, and I'm hoping that thing rocks. So can't wait. Well, can't isn't wait. It like a giant disaster style movie? Didn't we just have that with World War Z? Like, uh, it's the yeah, same kind of World like World War Z's bunch of zombies. This one's like. There are undersea creatures here to kill us. We got to make giant robots and go fight them. It's basically our answer to Godzilla. It's Del Toro's swan song to those kinds of movies. And if they do it right and they get the scale right, and more importantly, get story and character right, it just looks really, really interesting to me. I'm still concerned about hearing GLaDOS talk the whole time with the robot voice. I think that may have been a mistake because gamers are just going to be driven nuts by the fact that they're hearing that, that same actress with that same technology and that same tonal change. That's freaking weird, but the the movie itself looks pretty. I really, pretty awesome. I, I bet Grown Ups Two is going to beat it this weekend, actually, because it's approachable yeah. and it's one of those like, oh, I know these guys, I'm going to watch the movie, and it's going to make a lot of money. Ugh. All right, well, uh, let's go. Let's talk about what we're watching. What little there is. What we're watching. Uh, I'll tell you what, I didn't watch a dang thing this entire week because I was busy at the extravaganza that was Nerdtacular 13. Um, mm. it, but you managed to watch stuff on top of that, right, Scott? I did, and it was all last night and a little bit before. So I saw Lone Ranger, and right before we started the event, my wife and I watched Under the Dome, the premiere. I haven't seen the second episode yet. I hear it takes kind of a turn. According to Tom, anyway, it takes kind of a turn. He didn't like it. I'm a huge fan of that book, so... We enjoyed Under the Dome. And there was a little bit of cheese, but there's enough kind of losty kind of stuff going on and King stuff that I'm okay with it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see how that goes. And then the other one I like a lot, and I watched this last night, just kind of like comfort food for me, is the series Longmire. I'm about halfway through the first season, uh, catching up rapidly. Season two is already underway or already done maybe. Um, but, uh, it's, basically, it's, 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 it's it's CSI Wyoming, really, oh. if you want to come down to it. But it's in a way, it's you know, it's a little bit of justify. They're modern day cowboys solving crimes. Um, but I love the acting. Uh, Katie Sackhoff's in it. It's fantastic. Uh, it's a little predictable, but I don't care. It's like a soft, comfortable boot, and it's real nice to put it on. What about you, Is? I've been watching New Girl on Netflix. Like 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 all of them. I ran like, through I, the first season, the and that's all they have. Um, but it's so nice. I used to watch it on Hulu Plus, and I was like, hey, there's no ads, which I know I was saying before, why do people complain about it? But it was kind of nice to not have the ads. But the show was really weak when it first started. Uh, but it's all there, at least the first season is. And that was a big switch. It was a big news story when Netflix took New Girl away from Hulu because that was Fox saying, hey, why don't we go over here instead of our own owned company? So it was kind of a strange thing. But it's a fun show that lets me not think while I'm writing. Like it's, something's happening. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, I can keep catching up, no problem, as I'm writing up news fuses in the morning. Yeah, so it's candy. All right, man, let's do some feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. So last week, I finally, by the way, do you guys realize that this is the first episode of Frame Rate ever where everyone on the show was an actual cord cutter? So he's like, <laughs> now, we gotta, now we just got to harp on Tom. We could actually yeah. put our. Our mouth is, and you're so, recent. I know, and I know we don't have a ton of time, but in three words, Brian, how's it going? Because you're like a week into this. Uh, well, actually, that was a bit of an issue because while I was out at Nerdtacular, I got a rather upset phone call from Bonnie, who was very gracious. She was on board. She was like, "Yeah, let's go ahead and do it. Let's cut the cord. You know, we'll save all this money and we'll deal with it." Um, the kids didn't really find out that we had cut the cord. <laughs> Until I was out of town, and apparently that was the the cable apocalypse that uh, <laughs> that Bonnie had to deal with, and so I tried to on the phone explain to Penny like, no, we can buy a lot of content now, and it's better because you'll still get your stuff. And she's like, where is my Cartoon Network channel? So now I've got to uh, now I've got to invest some time and effort to uh, find all those solutions for uh, for Penelope <laughs> and uh, and Josie. Uh, but one of the things I said was I told everyone to take the chicken challenge where it's like basically if you're not really ready to cut the cord, at least 
pay less by calling and pretending to cut the cord. And I got uh, at least one email from somebody who said he meant to play chicken, but just ended up actually cutting the cord. And so he's like, well, I guess thanks. I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you how I feel later. But uh, just a quick roundup of some of the responses. We got like 30 responses. Uh, Lewis says, I took the chicken challenge uh, and ended up dropping the bill by $20 a month. Jason says uh, that it was kismet. Before frame rate posted, I had contacted Uverse to cut the cord. Uh, they offered me $15 off at first, and it gradually went up to $70 off my monthly bill. And he turned them down and uh, then ended up, I guess, actually cutting the cord. Scott says he took the challenge about two months ago with the full intention of dropping cable. Uh, he dropped the monthly bill for TV and Internet from $140 down to $80. And that's not a promotional rate. That was uh, They said it won't expire ever, which good luck. We'll see. It came with it and, and he got an Internet speed boost with it. Uh, Austin says he has Dish Network. Told, called and told him he wanted to cancel. He said he was paying fifty-four. They offer him a deal of twenty-three dollars a month. Asked them to put me down to the smallest package possible and got TV only for thirteen dollars a month, which was crazy talk. I couldn't even believe that. Uh, and John suggested that I try hooking my cable directly up to the TV. He says, I expect you'll find that they didn't even turn off the pipe and you're still getting some cable signals, which I tried it and I'm not. And uh, let's see, another guy says he was at 146 and dropped down to 112. So a lot of people are saving money, which is cool. Uh, finally, what Mike a scam, is, though, man! What a freaking scam this thing is! It just pisses me off. And, and and you, thank you by the way, being scam school man for like exposing this big rotten scabbed over wound of like <laughs> ripping people off. But my gosh, look at the the kind of money people are getting off simply because they call and threaten to get to get, to get off. I think it's just the worst thing ever, and this is really revealing to me. Anyway, go ahead. Well, but keep in mind also, like part of the reason that they're offering this, I mean, yes, these are these are highly lucrative deals where where they're, you know, they got giant fat margins compared to what it takes to actually install this stuff. Uh, and yeah, there's a lot of room that they could drop prices if they want to. And they will, considering, as we talked about, customer retention, like they've got to keep their numbers. They got to keep their their, uh, their their Comcasts happy, you know, their NBCs, their their HBOs, uh, by by presenting it as though they still have huge numbers. Uh, but the the one weird story we got was that he, he says he failed the chicken challenge because he had such good customer service that he wasn't able to uh, to to. They called his bluff basically. He called <laughs> and they were super polite, and she uh, just you know said, "Yeah, we can lose that service. What, what day you want to handle it?" And he was just like, "Um." Oh, wait, uh, Wimbledon's on, and then hung up, basically. <laughs> so uh, don't forget, guys, that if you want to send us feedback, send it to fr at twit.tv or frameratereshow at gmail.com. And I guess that's it, man. We made it. We stumbled through another episode without Tom Merritt. We want to thank uh, Aya Zaktar. Where can people see you? They can see me on this very network. I sit over there and do Tech News Today every day uh, with Tom when he's here, Sarah Lane, Jason Al, who's sitting back there. And on Thursdays, we do, we do Know How, a show that shows you all kinds of things, including how to get free HDTV with an antenna. We have a great episode there. Go to twit.tv slash kh to see how easy it is to get television for free in HD because there's still cartoons out there. You can watch them. <laughs> yeah, that's, I guess I'm going to have to watch that now and install it for, uh, for Penny. Uh, what about you, Scott? Oh, there's a slate of things people can find at frogpants.com. Specifically this week, if you're interested in seeing the aftermath of what Nerdtacular 2013 was and see what Brian did and, and Justin Robert Young and Tom Merritt and all these twit people, Veronica Belmont, if you want to see what we were up to, we're going to put a ton of photos, video, and all kinds of other content up at nerdtacular.com. But like I said, frogpants.com will get you everywhere you want to go. Right on, man. Well, thanks so much. We'll see you guys next week. Have a good one.